there and the assistant district attorney. So that we are appointed as guardian ad litem. Now that's different from some CASA programs that are only friend of the court or other types of programs, but we are a guardian ad litem program which gives us rights and duties under the Texas Family Code. So it's, it's a legal role. Okay. Then what we do, Voices for Children is appointed and then we hand the case to a volunteer. We assign a volunteer to the case. So you guys know that we won't just, hit, you're not on a waiting list. It's not, oh, Linda's up, we're gonna give her the next case, right? We're gonna, you're gonna fill out a case preference form next week. I've interviewed you all, I know you. Um, <clears throat> I think I've interviewed everybody except one person. And we know you, we have your notes and everything. And so you'll fill out that case preference and we'll say, you know, Jane said she wanted to work with small kids. She's tired of those college students, <laughs> those teenagers. Um, and so uh, she said she wanted to work with smaller kids and she travels to Houston regularly. Well, hey, we've got two toddlers, we've got toddlers, they're in uh, spring and, you know, this would be a great fit. So then we would call you up and say, hey, here are the basics, remove for parental drug abuse and neglect, are, are you interested? And at that point you can say yes or no, or you can say sure, send me the document. So we'll send you the affidavit and the other legal documents we have. You can review that, and at that point, you can say yes or no. Okay. So the ball's always in your court. We're not just going to hand you a case. We also really don't like to give people more than one case. Now, on two occasions, I've had volunteers come and say, just recently, say, you know, my case is gotten. They're in their adoptive placement or their permanent placement. Everything's really slowing down. I'd like another case. It's, it's happened twice recently. And um, we felt the volunteer was strong enough, uh, could advocate well. Now, we, did we give them a case with six kids? No. <laughs> but they asked for another case. And so on a case-by-case -case basis, we would say, sure, um, you can do that and try to keep it with the same supervisor and, and things like that. So um, that has happened in the past. But in general, we don't want you to have more than one case. All right? I have a quick question. It's actually yeah. about conflict of interest. Sure. If we know one of the professionals in the case, like say we know the attorney or we know the therapist or we know some sort of doctor, do we have to excuse ourselves? Not a professional on the okay. case. If you knew a family member, yes. Okay. All right. Good question. Um, oh my gosh, I thought I took all the animation out of here. <laughs> um, so once you accept the case, you'll come in and fill out that case uh, opening uh, paperwork. Uh, once you do that, you guys set it, you and your advocate supervisor set a tentative plan for what's going to happen in the next month. Okay, so you're not on your own. Your supervisor's get telling you this is who we need to contact, this is the caseworker, this is they like to text rather than email or whatever it is, kind of laying the groundwork for you um, so it can move on and you'll get started. Um, so, so once again, what is the timeline then on this? So you get the case mm -hmm. and how soon is the CASA okay, so getting that interaction? As soon as possible. Okay. Um, you get the case. You will probably have, the adversary has already happened, so you have about two months before you're going to court. Does that sound about right? So you've got that two months to do all that work um, or anything else that comes up in between. Okay. Um, but you want to start, uh, when we talked about Optima, we'll, we'll talk, I don't think we're going to talk about it on Saturday. I'm glad you said it's that. It's on the. I know. I think I changed it to, is CASA panel on there also? Yes, it's on there also. It's okay. Well, we'll have to get Joyce here on Saturday. That's all there is to it. So basically it's 9 a.m. Optima <laughs> yeah. and then 11. 30 CASA panel. Thank you. Um, yes, we'll have Optima training. Okay. Joyce will be thrilled. <laughs> um, we may move it around so she doesn't have to do it until the afternoon. Um, but you're going to have about two months to do all that, but you want to be putting all that stuff right. in your contact log so when you're building your court report about 14 days out or even sooner, um, okay. you've got all that information. So here are your responsibilities, just one more time. Face-to-face -face contact with the child and the parents. Face-to-face -face monthly, so these are monthly. Face-to-face, -face, I'm sorry, phone, email, or face-to-face -face <coughs> contact with the caseworker, the therapist, and the foster parent. Okay if there is a therapist. Regular contact with your advocate supervisor, that will be through email, phone calls, and you'll have a face-to-face -face meeting once a month. And keep in mind, this does not have to be in our office. Um, the staff like to get out and about, so if you'd rather meet at Starbucks, or, and you can have some privacy there, or you're at lunch at work, you guys can meet somewhere, so don't feel like you're always gonna have to come downtown, okay? Quarterly contact with the other professionals, like the AAL, the attorney ad litem, the parents therapist and service providers and the child school 
Okay. So those are your once a month, three months. Anybody got any questions? We went over those the first day, but this is just kind of a reminder of what your requirements are, your, your minimum expectations. So um, you should have that when you meet with your advocate supervisor, you should know um, she should be going through those with you so you'll know what's coming up for the next month. Case notes, and we talked about not recording people because people are already paranoid, right? And um, so if you don't, it, I suppose you can ask permission, but we really want to stay away from recording. But you can say, gosh, I really, uh, I need to take a few notes so I'll be accurate in what you told me, okay? So in your notes, yeah, go ahead. You did say it was also all right to ask them if we could take like a picture, right, of their house. Of, of their house. I think I remember. Yeah, that would be if we're recommending reunification. Right. It would be way down the line, okay. and you should have a pretty good relationship with the parent by then. Okay. Yeah, but you wouldn't like snap. No, of course not. <laughs> no, we've had that happen. <laughs> you think I make this stuff up? <laughs> so you want to have the who you talk to, the date, the time, the place, your observations. Remember court reports about what you see and what you hear. So you want to take good notes. It's not about how you feel. Um, the feelings that were expressed by whoever was there, right? Whoever you're interviewing. So child expressed he'd like to live with his mother. I think in a court report I read this morning or this afternoon, which was cracking me up, these kids, all, th all the kids, all four of them said they were tired of talking to so many people. <laughs> and I thought, I bet you are, you know, foster parents, caseworkers, CASAs, all that kind of stuff. So you want to write down the feelings that they had, uh, what they said, and a summary of what happened. But remember, it's fact, fact-based recommendations, okay? Not how I feel about it. Why? Because this is a legal document that you're writing. We are going to file it with the court. All legal parties have access to it. That's why we're asking in your court reports that you say something positive about each child as you start your paragraph. Because, you know, parents have a chance to read this. It might be nice for them to, say, to see their child is happy in their placement or is involved in sports or whatever it is. So we want to start with something positive so the judge gets to know the child a little bit more than just a name on a piece of paper. And also so parents can see that and children have access to all of this. Do they have, they have access to the legal documents after they're 18 or at any time? After 18. If they're 18. So, so that's our perception and our feeling about the kids, right? Is, most of it's quantitative. Most of it is. So I wouldn't say I feel like uh, Johnny is happy at school. I would say uh, Johnny reported he is interested in reading, um, looks forward uh, is enjoying his summer but looks forward to going back to school and being with his friends. Okay. So those are all facts. Those are things he said to me. Okay. And, and with yeah. the schools, we can we ask to see like their grades? Yes. Okay. In fact, um, some classes are put on as parents in the system so you can go in and observe grades and attendance. Okay. And I would really connect with the school counselor on that if you have older youth. That could, and I'm talking like 12 plus, not that much older. Okay. And if they receive um, special education services, we should be the surrogate parent. So we would be in the ARD meeting. Okay. And CASA can attend the ARD meeting. They have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can call in, um, but you should, or your supervisor should. And does everybody know what an ARD meeting is? Mm -hmm. Okay. We can get copies of their IEPs too, right? Uh-huh, get copies of all that. All right, so why are we asking you to take notes and fill out stuff in Optima Credibility? Okay, if I come in with a court report that says, I think mom is really a jerk, that is not quality advocacy unless I say, mother has uh, expressed this, this, and this, has done this, this, and I mean, I read a court report yesterday um, that said um, mother has, it, see, it appears mother has not bonded with the child uh, because the child is doing this, this, and this, and mother is doing this, this, and this during the visit, or not doing this, this, and this during the visits. So you see, it's fact-based. That's but you went to observe the visit, you saw it is quality advocacy, and it's backed up by facts. Okay. Um, again, it's important for the contested hearing or trial, and most importantly, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. That's kind of a strange concept, but it's true. If we didn't write it down, if it's not in black and white and in that record, it didn't happen. There's no way I can prove it uh, other than my documentation. Okay, so time logs, they're contact logs. I'm sorry I didn't change the name. Why are they important? Because your supervisor reads them to get caught up on things. It's going to assist you in writing your court report. And most importantly, if you don't do it, it looks like you're not doing anything on your case. 
And that's important for two reasons. One, we get funded based on your hours, right? So if we if you're not putting any hours in there, that's what is we what is it, twenty-six dollars an hour you guys are worth? Twenty-four. Twenty-four, all right. Twenty I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good rate. <laughs> so that we can use that in leverage and grants. So when they say what is your local cash match, we can say twenty-four dollars an hour times a thousand volunteers or whatever. Um, and so uh, that's important, but also uh, it looks like you haven't done anything when we get audited. For May, there were 520 hours logged, so that's about $12,480. Thank you, so, Corey. It is very important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and those are just hours reported. So mm -hmm. don't forget to put your documentation time, your drive time, all of that is important in your contact log, in your hours that you submit. And uh, the other reason is we get audited by Texas CASA and National CASA, and if there's no contact log in there, it looks like you didn't do anything. And they say, why isn't this child being visited? Why isn't this child being uh, served by this volunteer? Okay? And we'll take a hit on it and can be financially penalized for lack of activity on a case. So it's like the worst, most boring part of your job, but you've got to do it. So we're going to have a full-blown uh, two-hour Optima training in July. I don't have a date yet, but hopefully I'll have one by next week. As a matter of fact, Kate should write herself a note on that. <laughs> also, um, imagine if something happens to you, you would want the same information that you have to be in our database so mm -hmm. that when a volunteer has to pick it up, there's no loss of information. Um, also, I'm, I'm looking at the case right now on my phone. I can read all the data and I can see what happened to that case from my phone. Um, if there's good documentation, so I'll let you know. Um, but yeah, sometimes we have to cover. Say you were out of the country for Christmas vacation and you're, you're, so is your supervisor. Well, we have to step in. Ideally, yes, we're planning ahead and we have notes, but if somebody's sick or something that we don't have, that can't send us notes, um, we should be able to look in Optima and read up on the file really quickly and get caught up on what's going on. As well as the court report, but sometimes I can see court notes and I can see what happened after hearings or any other updates since the court report was filed should be in Optima because we can, I should be able to log in and see what's going on in the case. So it's a paper trail that's needed for all kinds of reasons, grant purposes and everything, but we really want to be able to look in and, and get caught up if something happens to you. Like you go to Europe. Not something happens to you, get hit by a car. <laughs> Be much more fun to go to Europe. Okay, so um, you want to, we'll see this in Optima, but you can fill in all the contacts or any other information that you have, interested parties, all that kind of stuff. So um, your supervisor can do it or you can do it, but as soon as you have that information, you want to put all that into Optima. But, you know, if you spend three hours reading a file at CPS, that's volunteer time. You know, you want to put that in your log. Um, case review. So you're going to meet with your supervisor once a month. Why do you do it? So you guys know what's going on. So <clears throat> you want to update your supervisor. Now you should be practicing an inclusive email process or practice rather. And so you should be including your supervisor in all of your correspondence. So in fact, if you do go to Europe, I'm going to start using that now instead of if I get hit by a bus. <laughs> if I go to Europe unexpectedly. Um, then uh, we should be able to pick right up, just like AJ was talking about. Um, it also will give you a to-do list for the next month, so you're not just out there blindly wondering what it is you're supposed to do. It'll remind you of your quarterly contacts and help you ask questions and brainstorm together. Remember, we're going to ask you, and AJ says this all the time, the supervisor is the expert on the system, right? Um, who to talk to, how to get there, navigate that a little bit. You should be the expert on the family, uh, the kids, the family so that's what you're going to be spending your time doing and we're going to help you navigate the rest of it we're going to send that court order out ahead of you everywhere you go you'll have a copy of it to take with you when you go to schools or doctor's offices or other places okay at the end of every case review schedule the next one that's your little tip don't you love this and another person made this it always cracks me up the pictures and animation and everything everybody puts in there so Ask questions and brainstorm. There they are, brainstorming. All right, so you, we do this in Optima now, but there used to be a case review form um, that looks like this. But basically what most advocate supervisors do is take all of this information and paste it right into Optima. So you should be able to go and see what it is you need to be doing. 
Um, we may start using that to-do list. That doesn't seem to be very popular among the advocate supervisors, but it may be helpful. Um, we've only been using Optima for a year, so we're still new to it also. All right, when do you need a court report? All right, what is every hearing, and what do you say? You would need a court report. Um, yeah, this comes next, sorry. I don't, uh, for every regularly scheduled hearing, so for those progress hearings that the judge calls in the middle, no, no court report, but for every regularly scheduled hearing, status, initial permanency, permanency, and final. Okay. So remember, your early family engagement volunteer is going to do that adversary court report, so that you'll have that to work from, and your next one will be the status hearing. So your first report that you'll write Nine times out of ten will be for the status hearing in real life. Status, initial permanency. Yeah, so uh, already, already every, uh, permanency, and, permanency final. and final. And I think Taylor already gave this to you guys, but here is the docket uh, link. So you can go on and look at the docket anytime. Um, like we printed that out last night, but I was still worried it had changed. So, because um, it might. And then your uh, advocate supervisor should be reminding you, and you can find your next hearing in Optima. Okay. Uh, what is each hearing for? To make your recommendations and express concerns, and very much so to move it forward on its timeline. So we are the folks given this a sense of urgency. I have noticed that CPS gives it urgency in number of days, right? Oh my gosh, we're at month five. Mom hasn't been doing anything. What are we going to do? How are we going to change our permanency plan? Um, we're supposed, you know, we need to give it urgency. We found these family members. Why is this kid still in foster care? You know, um, this is what we've discovered. Let's move it along. Let's hear have a progress hearing in two weeks instead of in three months. So that's our job: is to stand up, give recommendations, uh, and make sure that we are representing the best interest of the child, but also move that forward on its timeline. Um, and then this that we've already talked about, come early, talk to all parties, you might get new information, but if you do and your recommendations are going to significantly, or change at all, but significantly change, talk to everybody. Nobody likes surprises. Just like you wouldn't want to be surprised, we don't want to surprise them. What do you say? Who's nervous about talking in court? Everybody. <laughs> yes, so what you're going to do, I will tell you, Judge Delaney in Brazos County says, CASA has nothing to add. It's a perfectly good response. Okay, so if you agree, if you, if CPS has said it, mom's attorney has said it, dad's attorney has said it, and the attorney ad litem has said it, and you're in agreement, no need to restate it. Okay, he doesn't like that, and most judges don't. They don't want to hear a repeat or a rehash of everything. If you have something significantly different to say, um, then that's your opportunity to say it. And I've told this story before. Um, one of the attorney ad items brought up the fact that we ha that there was an aunt ready to take this baby. He was 18 months old. He had asthma. <clears throat> they didn't want him. Uh, and but CPS, big bureaucracy. They needed a special nurse from Austin to teach the aunt how to do breathing treatments. Has anybody here ever given a breathing treatment? Mm -hmm. Ever had one? Is it brain surgery? No. no. But because it's a bureaucracy, they had to have a special nurse from Austin to come train the aunt. Well, we really felt, CASA felt like uh, CPS was really dragging their feet. And there was a good reason. Foster mom was a nurse. So baby was in a licensed foster care, unrelated foster care. Foster mom was a nurse. Everything's going fine. Baby's happy. They didn't have time, I'm sure, to set this up and make it happen. So we have to be the squeaky wheel. So it was in our court report. But additionally, the CASA volunteer brought the baby to court because the child was being described as medically fragile, which he's 18 months old, he had asthma. That's, that's a serious thing, but I wouldn't call it fragile. Um, so she brought this bouncing baby boy to court, said, sir, the aunt is here today. Um, all she needs is breathing treatment, training. We've been asking for it for three months. It hasn't happened. And I watched Judge Delaney turn to CPS and say, how fast can you make that happen? Okay, so that's what court hearings are for. <laughs> you can do something powerful like that. And only CASA has that time and attention to do that. I'm sure CPS was open to the ant doing it, but who's got the time when you've got 30 cases to make that happen, right? Or to make it a priority. Let me put it that way. All right. Uh, and always, 
run your, and we've already talked about this, run it by your advocate supervisor. And again, make them defend their position. You may have information that the supervisor doesn't have. Um, if you don't agree with it, follow it right up the chain of command because you, without a doubt, the CASA volunteer has more information than anybody else. Um, and it, it just could be, a, and I, I agree with AJ, most of the time it's miscommunication that lead to a disagreement. Um, how do I know and with, when and with whom I can share information? We went through this the other night. Attorney ad litem and CPS, yes, you can uh, share it with them. They are legal parties to the case. Therapy notes, we, that is not our information to share. Okay, so if the attorney says to you, hey, I can't get those therapy notes, uh, they won't call me back, can you give them to me? No, not our information to share. Okay, foster parents, what do we do with foster parents? Nothing. <laughs> well, we, we don't can, identify them. Right. Not identify them in court reports, but if foster mom is asking me, how's mom doing on her services? What's mm -hmm. going on? Can I adopt these kids? Oh, I love it. Such good class. Or tell them to go to court. I'm sorry. Or, or tell them to go to court and watch. Exactly. Teachers. Teachers are going to want to know. What do we tell them? CPS. <laughs> Talk to CPS. It's not our information to give. Okay? And... At this, by the same token, there's confidential and then there's protecting information because you don't want anybody else to have it. That's not always good either. <laughs> so, if you'll look at your flow chart, uh, the most important question, one of the most important questions is, is it in the best interest of the child to release this information? Right? Because we're all about best interest. Here you go. You got it. Okay. Um, if the answer is no, resist sharing the information, all right? Uh, if it's in their best interest and the person is legally entitled to it, yes, okay, you can share. Um, but you would always contact your program staff. Um, so you can see on here, if it's in their best interest, yes, but is it in my information to share? Okay, so that's a good, a good thing. So how mom's doing in her parenting class is not my information to share. Okay. How uh, is the, so always are they is it my information are they legally entitled to it um, and uh, if they are then you can share it so basically your legally entitled people are CPS attorney ad litem and the district attorney anybody else am I missing anybody in the case All, the attorneys what about the mom's attorney or the dad's attorney. What about just in general, the attorneys? To share any, any information? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you answer that, AJ. Yeah. Um, I would say within the child advocate, so the CPS worker, the DA, ADA, and then the child's attorney, sometimes things just need to keep to stay in that loop. I'd like to say we need to be transparent with everybody, but especially um, They would probably be a first, the first avenue. Like if you need permission, if the state has custody, they are the parent at this point, not the parent. Um, but parents still have rights within the system when they don't have custody of their kids. So um, ideally, we're transparent with everybody, but you don't have to do it all the time, especially if it's something um, on a day-to-day -day basis with with a foster parent that you're wanting to share the information with a relative because it's already been approved that they be able to have contact, foster parents are willing to do it. It's not our number to give out, but we can request from CPS that we get written permission to share that information, then you can share it. Um, so attorneys for parents. So if it's about the child, then we get the attorneys to talk to each other. Okay. Or to talk to CPS. Yeah, we would always refer them back to CPS because okay. the attorneys for the parents have a totally, they're not into best, in, they're not, they're looking right. out for the legal interest. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It may not be in the best interest of the child necessarily for the attorney's parents, for parents' yeah. attorneys yeah. to yeah. know. Yeah. It's kind of a fine line. I mean, it I don't, yeah. it'd be kind of rare for that to happen, but it does. I mean, the child advocates often talk with one another mm -hmm. because they're the ones caring for the kids. The attorneys. The parents are defending the clients. So. 
Well, I think like the flip side of that is we wouldn't be entitled to information that the parent's attorney has about the parent, right? Not necessarily. That That's why we go to the parent. Now, right. if you can't get in touch with the parent, that we were talking about this in staffing this morning, nobody can find the mother. Well, who's talked to the mother's attorney? You know, that's a good source. I've been trying to reach the mom. I've been trying to reach the mom. Casa wants to talk to mom. Can you help me out? Mm -hmm. But if there's confidential information shared between the attorney and the parent, we wouldn't be entitled to that. So we yeah. would want to be also be discerning about what we share. And I think discerning is exactly the right word. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the most important thing we learned last night, if you're unclear, <laughs> wait and ask your advocate supervisor, right? Okay. All right. So we, we kind of went through this on the flow chart. Should I share it? Well, are they legally entitled to it? Is it my information to share? And is it in their best interest? Okay. That's, those are your most important questions. So a lot of people have been talking about how to protect their information. You want to keep it in a safe place. I have one volunteer that has a, a briefcase that he has. That's his cost of briefcase. He keeps everything in it. And he keeps Nobody looks at it, right? The family knows that's mine. Don't touch it. Kids don't get in it. Um, and that's the stuff. Um, so you want to keep it where others don't have access. Now, most of your stuff is going to be online. So if you don't have a password for your computer, <laughs> you want to get one, right? Because I know Anthony was kind enough to come help me with my computer at home, and mine has a password because Anthony's just that kind of guy. I wouldn't have done it. I've been like, who's in the house but me? You know? But he set me up with a password. So um, when disposing of records, everything has to be shredded. So if you have anything at home, you bring it to us. We have a big barrel. We put it in, and we'll get it shredded for you. You don't have to shred it. Do not email your cost of court report until it's been filed. Okay, so you don't get to, we'll email it to every, well, we'll file it with the court who will give it to all the legal parties. But you don't want to shoot it over to CPS and then get a quick look at it. Okay. Uh, we do not release records to attorneys, other parties, or professionals unless they're legally entitled. And in general, you're not going to be releasing records. That's just a good rule of thumb. And at the end of your case, you'll be asked to bring everything back. Now, most of these are going to be online. So we are uh, looking at, and I think doing before the end of next week, giving all of you a, it would be like a Jackson Casa at vfcbrazos.org. Then everything is in a Google Drive. Everything is online. And we can cut off the access to that if you go to Europe. <laughs> you can, you yeah, can say, I would say most CASA programs do this. You use your personal email. We ask that you create a separate Gmail account and link to your email, whatever. Well, we're going to add another layer of what I think is, is good practice um, of safety and that we will give you a Gmail account so that we can share your file with you and everything and those emails of yours relating to the case are our property basically and we can we'll have it and then we um we can turn it off if we need to or when you resign from the case so all of that stored instead of us you sending us all your old emails or printing them out or whatever and stuff getting mixed in with your personal um Stuff. If you just log into your CASA email, to Gmail, you have your file, and all the emails are stored in one place. Jane, so, um, once a case is finished, once you finished with the case, did, did, does access to the information get closed off, or can you look like, say, two years down the road, you say, oh, you know, I, I wonder how I want to go back to that because there, there was something similar in this case that I handled. Well, all of our files will be seven um, years ours our storage in Optima though, so mm -hmm. they'll always be there okay. as long as we have the okay. database. Um, we can dump Gmail folder or Google Drive folders if we need to, but it lasts for at least seven years. Um, and then, um, so going back, so I used to, um, in Austin, we had 15 cases a week. And so the EFE volunteers who would do that initial visit and, you know, it was part of kind of retaining them and let them know what happened in the case a year down the road or whatever. So we can look at it and give you an update if you were the cost up on it before. Okay. We will notify you if, if the case comes back, you're the first person to call. Um, and that doesn't and we, happen very often. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty rare, but um, then we'll evaluate whether you should be on it or not. Um, um, but if you're curious about something, yes, I mean, feel free to ask, uh, especially um, since you're not allowed to, or you're not really supposed to contact them after your case right. closes. Right. Um, we may not have any information, mm -hmm. but um, 
It's worth it. I mean, ask for whatever you want. <laughs> ask for whatever you want. That trip to Europe. But your supervisor can check in and not know what, what kind of information yeah. we would be able to have. But um, since you're, as long as you're as foreign possible. Marissa, so if we download documents on our computer, is it sufficient enough to just like delete it all? Do we need to bring the computer to you to show you that we've deleted everything? Okay. Not so far. <laughs> no. All right. So we've talked about foster parents. They need rel uh, relevant information about the child, but they have that contractual relationship with CPS, so we always refer them back to CPS. And remember, our focus is on the child and the child's needs. Okay. All right, this is the, it's so, it, now it's why, this is kind of dated. Why don't they call me back? Why don't they text me? Why don't they email me? Um, so we've talked about an inclusive email process. So when they say, I never got that, you can say, well, actually, I sent it on this day at this time and you received it. Because you can do read receipts um, in your email. Um, you remember that the parent and the placement information can change pretty regularly. Um, or often rather, and so that may be, and parents' phone numbers are going to change or they run out of minutes on their phone, so there could be all kinds of reasons why they're not calling you back. Um, you want to document every attempt. Try to call mom three times. Give yourself 15 minutes, okay, if you made like six phone calls and it took you five minutes, what did we say? Round up, okay? Um, so you want to document all your attempts so when the judge says at the trial, and you're the witness, well, how did you try to call, or the attorney says, did you try to call mom? Why, actually, I did. I tried to call her six times on this day, five times on this day, you know, so we have a record of it, okay? Um, if you're not getting people to call you back, if you can't uh, reach anybody, caseworker's not calling you, it's really become a pain in the neck, um, or a pain in the foot, as the case may be, um, your supervisor can coordinate a staffing with all the parties, okay? Um, always ask your supervisor for support if you're having several failed attempts, okay? So why don't you feel like everyone likes you? <laughs> because it's advocacy, it's not agreeing with everybody. We, uh, we were in the staffing this morning talking about um, CPS hands are tied in this particular case with a mom who's basically checked off everything on her service plan but has made no real progress, but they have no grounds to not send the kids back, except for stuff that CASA can do. So CASA's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with CPS in the courtroom. CPS knows it and they're okay with it because they know we can say things and do things they can't do. But if this is an adversarial process. We're not here to make friends. We are here to be the squeaky wheel and be the best interest of the kid. Um, if foster families are brushing you off or giving you a hard time, remember they've got caseworkers from CPS, caseworkers from their agency. They've got a ton of people demanding their time. Um, and attorneys representing the client, their clients have a different interest than CASA. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one thing I think I took out, it is okay to talk to the attorney's assistant. Most of the time the attorney's assistant is doing most of the work. Um, so it's perfectly fine to talk to them. You can freely share the same information with that assistant that you can with the attorney. Okay. All right. Am I asking too many questions? Probably not. <laughs> How do I know I'm crossing the line? We talked a little bit about that last night. How do you think you would know if you were crossing the line? Huh? If I'm withholding information, what about if I'm thinking, huh, I wonder if I should do this. Is that usually a good indicator that, wait, <laughs> I'm wondering, should I do this? Yeah, then that means wait, talk to somebody first. Um, and then, of course, is it okay to talk to the attorney's assistant? Okay, questions, this is the end. What questions do you have? Kind of basic stuff, stuff we've already gone through, but want to give it a good, uh, thorough, we want you to know what the expectations are and what your job is. Yes, ma'am. So we've kind of skirted around this, but I guess I would appreciate more clarity. What is the policy on gift giving? Obviously, you don't want to make a routine out of it, but if it's Christmas time or a holiday or something like that, right. is it a <coughs> Birthday gifts, yes. Holidays we take care of. Okay. And we also will have this clothing drive in the summer. Okay. So, no, you don't want to be the gift giver. You don't want to be every time you show up, you bring a a snack or a doll or whatever because we are not the gift givers. Um, we have a different role than that. Um, and some of these kids, 
may expect that you're bringing them something every time. But no, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't, but let's play a game, you know, or whatever. So, uh, no, the policy is um, don't use your own money, <laughs> if, if at all possible. We have games, toys. Um, I have 60 knit hats in my office. Should a child need a hat? I have one. Thank goodness we're having a clothes and drive is all I can say. <clears throat> so a lot of times, <clears throat> especially after Christmas, we have a lot of toys and games and other stuff in the office. Um, if you feel, this happened. So uh, foster relative placement, not foster placement, who was not going to be paid, wanted to do a special summer school uh, for the CASA child. <laughs> really couldn't afford it, was asking for reimbursement from CASA. Didn't look like we were going to have a donor. The CASA volunteer on that case paid for it through Voices for Children and remained anonymous. Okay, so that's going to be the best way to do things, is through the agency. And when you give a gift, make sure that they know this is from CASA, not from me. This is from the people at Voices for Children had this today and I gave it to you. Is that, is that better? Yes. Okay. That's one of the probably, and you know, gift giving is, is great, but it's kind of, um, it's another thing we ask you to do to be selfless in not giving gifts. Mm -hmm. Because it makes you feel good to be able to, to, to give a gift and you want to be giving and all of that, but um, that's really not what we're here for. And it can actually be used against you. Mm -hmm. um, and it just protects our credibility. And if we have one cost of doing it, mm -hmm. it affects all the other costs too. You still have the library? Yes. yes. So that was a very useful tool for me. And again, it depends on the kid's age. I'd go and get a book, and that helped me with the evaluation of the child as we went through the book. What are those colors? And it turned out two of the kids had learning disabilities. And CPS certainly didn't have the time. The school was, they weren't there long. And, and so that was an opportunity. And, and the kids didn't have it. And we have books you can you can give to the family that they can keep. Um, but we do have books you can check out as well. Yeah. So you check them out and go over it with the child and then bring them back. You can or you Color can. numbers. They, okay. I, they were given from CASA. Pulled them right out of the library, age appropriate, and went through it and then scaled down to their actual level. To, so I could actually do a court report saying, hey, this is where I see this kid at. Right. Because the system was not in place to hold evaluations yet. Right. And they bounced schools a couple times, so nobody was invested in. I would say when there is a need, um, also, like, if we have a kid that comes into care and they're in high school and they don't have any clothes, they don't have any clothes, and see kids are lacking on clothes, um, we have what I want everybody to teach these kids and the parents, too, is, is how to be really resourceful. So buying them some new clothes is not necessarily the answer all the time. Will we fill up an, an immediate need? Um, that's really the caregiver's responsibility. What resources can we show them quickly um, as to where to go in the community? If we didn't exist, I want to get to the point where we can step out of this situation and where nobody's dependent on us for so anything. Teach me in the fish. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, there are uh, also, we just don't want you paying for it yourself. We can find ways, uh, major donors sometimes are willing to do. Um, certain things like, but like with this, uh, we, we have a kid flying to um, see a relative in Washington. Well, the initial ask was for CASA to pay for that trip. Well, we wait a little bit and ask people to get a little more creative, um, and it ended up being paid for, but it wasn't for us. And I protect that not because I don't want to give these kids a world, but it's really our, our purpose is different than, than providing the gifts. So, um, we do do the um, clothing drive that starts tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. where we ask kids to get their sizes. Because sometimes, you know, what you get from CPS is like the wrong size of underwear or the wrong size of socks. Like you wear certain socks with certain shoes or whatever, and the CPS is not there to give you the right size of socks. But something like the toy drive or, or the clothing drive is is a way that we can get matched donors with specific requests, and then the kids get it. Um, and then also we don't want kids coming back to a situation, bless you, if the um, idea is to work towards kids going back to the very same physical environment, I mean maybe not physical environment, but back to their parents, they're going back to a situation where they're not
not going to be able to have, so let's, a whole lot, possibly. Um, so let's not get them used to getting things all the time or interacting with a lot of people that give them kind of whatever they want or, or give them the nicest of nice things. Um, let's focus on, on getting the kids out of foster care, whether it's back with their parents or um, in a safe home where they maybe don't get everything they want, but they are safe and we know that it's going to be a permanent situation. We've got to focus on that. All right. Before you buy it yourself, let the supervisor know we will probably have a resource or the child welfare board. We know how to advocate to get things that kids need without paying for it ourselves. We've been sitting a long time. Let's take 10 minutes. Remember, there's bathrooms upstairs. <laughs>